Welcome to the History of the World podcast. My name is Chris. This is episode 17, The First Villages. We are on the Japanese islands and the year is 13,500 BCE. Humans have been on these islands for at least the last 20,000 years. The people of Japan have been living in hunter-gatherer societies. As of yet, there has been no categorical signs of agriculture or farming. The islands of Japan are very fertile, with plenty of forests allowing the people to forage for nuts and berries. The fibrous material of plants is being used to construct baskets and nets, with which a couple of men punting along the river's edge in their hollowed out log can capture salmon with their hooks and spears. After they have a good amount of fish, they make their way back to the shore and where there is a clearing at the forest's edge. They hang the salmon out to dry on a purpose-built wooden frame that sits next to a wooden hut shelter which has carefully been constructed over a large narrow pit which has been dug into the ground. Large posts hold up the huts which are covered in thatched material for shelter and are suitable to comfortably hold an entire family. Alongside the hut there are four other huts with each containing another friendly family eager to assist with the preparation of the salmon that has been fished and the nuts that have been foraged. The acorns are to be found in a very large clay pot which has been carefully made using wet clay and the creator has gone to the trouble of creating an artistic band around the outside of the pot before he fire hardened it on the smouldering wood fire next to the water's edge. Some of the nuts are taken into the hut by a lady who takes care when entering the hut to go down the step to the lowered floor. She didn't want to take the pot because it's a bit too heavy to pick up and carry. Once inside the hut, she puts the nuts into a pot of water fixed in place at the side of the hut. The water is hot so that the nuts can be softened, but the heat comes from a fire underneath the pot. The people inside the hut do not worry about the smoke caused by the fire as the smoke escapes through an underground channel that was dug earlier in the summer that can allow the smoke to escape through a hole in the surface of the ground outside. Dinner is almost ready which is just as well because two of the men have just arrived back from the pit trap on the edge of the woods where they have been lucky enough to have caught a wild boar, which will keep the tribe from getting hungry for the rest of the week. This is an early Jomon village, but it's only their village for the summer. When winter comes, the families will move on to a winter settlement but they can quite likely come back here next year when the weather picks up again. Evidence of this way of life has been discovered through archaeological research and could be considered as one of the first villages. Wooden post holes have been discovered in the ground and shards of pottery that appear to belong to large clay vessels that would have proved difficult to carry over any kind of distance. There appears to be no evidence of an agricultural existence. This means that earliest village life did not rely on the emergence of agriculture first. In an area of affluent foraging, it seems to be quite reasonable that small village societies could have had a sedentary style of life, even if it was only for half of the year at a time. Palynology Let's go back to the Fertile Crescent and take what we have learned from the Jomon people of Japan and put it into our research of the emergence of village life. Of course, we wouldn't want to just believe 
those that tell us that people developed agriculture and then started to build villages to live in afterwards, would we? We'd want to be a bit more open-minded and sensible and say, why would you build a farm somewhere that you didn't live? Surely someone would just steal your farm while you weren't there, and you'd probably be right. So we need to look for evidence of sedentary lifestyle, that is a life at a settled location in the Fertile Crescent. We can find something of interest at a site called Tel Abu Huraira, which can be found in the Euphrates Valley in modern day Syria. Tel Abu Huraira is an extremely interesting site to start our studies, due to the fact that it may have been occupied as long ago as 11,500 BCE, which seems to be much earlier than the emergence of agriculture, but it appears to have been abandoned by 5,000 BCE, which is undeniably after agriculture had firmly been established. It is now that we need to introduce a new brand of science that can assist us in understanding the lifestyles of people. We've all heard the phrase, you are what you eat. So if we can find out what people were eating, then we can find out what people were doing. In terms of consumption, you cannot get far away from the plant kingdom. And one thing that we can associate with seed plants is pollen. And the great thing about pollen is that it gets absolutely everywhere. And it gets preserved. Pollen study comes under the wider study called palynology, which loosely speaking is the study of organic particles such as pollen of course. If we go back to episode 8 about the ice ages, we discussed how ice cores can tell us about the climate of the earth. And to study further back in time, we study deeper down the core. The same principle works if we take a core sample from the earth. Depending on how deep down the core sample we want to go, we can extract the pollen and it will tell us a lot about what was going on at that point in time in the past. So if we go back to our site in modern Syria called Tel Abu Huraira, we can use palynology to determine that the earliest residents of the site in around 11,000 BCE were already starting to cultivate rye. Which if you remember from episode 15, we determined was a weed plant that was accidentally created by the human desire to cultivate wheat. So if the studies have indeed been dated accurately, which is often difficult, then we can see that the first settlers may have begun cultivating crops and they may have been forced to do this by the dramatic climate change brought on by the younger Dryas, the radical temperature drop in the northern hemisphere that undoubtedly killed a lot of the plant resources of the Fertile Crescent. We don't know that this is the entire truth because obviously we were not there, but we have uncovered enough to be able to start piecing together possible explanations. And that's what studying history is all about. So we're doing a good job, right? Tel, Tel Abu, Abu Huraira. Let us work out what happened at Tel Abu Huraira during its 6,000 year occupation. During episode 15, we spoke of the people of the Natufian culture. The Natufians were Epipaleolithic peoples who showed early signs of sedentary behaviour in the Levant region of the Fertile Crescent. Epipaleolithic refers to the very final part of the Old Stone Age. The Natufians were the people who have been credited for the creation of of the settlement at Tel Abu Huraira and the most likely somewhat simultaneous cultivation of cereal crops nearby as shown 
by the palynological records. Certainly, we believe that the Natufians were here by 11,000 BCE. The cultivation of cereal crops is supported by the change in seeds from the different geological levels at the site. The earliest level demonstrates typical wild seeds, while a more recent level shows a change into the larger seeds typical of deliberate cultivation. The change in seed styles coincides with a drought contemporary to the younger Dryas. So that gives us an incredibly strong indicator for the catalyst of agriculture at this particular site. Cultivation was essential for survival, so it would appear. Evidence of thatched wooden round huts have been uncovered. So it does appear that the Natufians felt that it was the safest bet to settle in the area and went to some effort to make it comfortable. The fact that it has been guessed that around 200 people were settled there in the early years demonstrates that a few tribes may have linked together and set about creating a sedentary village of huts and farmland. 200 people gathered at one place is like nothing we've come across. Certainly, nomadic tribes were believed to have consisted of groups of around 30 or 40. Even the typical Japanese site mentioned at the start of the podcast would surely have been a site of less than 30 members. Here we can see a serious change, and maybe it was necessary for the tribes to amalgamate for the sake of safety in numbers. With a limit on resources putting pressure on people to take an agricultural route, a successful site like Tel Abu Huraira would have been the envy of those passing by, and surely there would have been contemplation of a takeover which required large numbers to resist. Smaller sites that emerged may well have been built and destroyed, leaving little to the archaeological record. A new method of dating called accelerator mass spectrometry, which actually attempts to count the amount of carbon-14 atoms as opposed to the record of the radioactive decay radiation present, was used at Tel Abu Huraira to give accurate dates to the seeds discovered at the site. They have told us a chronological story of the site and it appears that after the initial success the site may have been somewhat abandoned at around 8000 BCE before a re-emergence of success and some definite evidence of advanced domestication of the crops. It does appear that another nearby site called Murebet actually expanded during the abandonment of Tel Abu Huraira, so it may have been a simple migration. It could have been that domestication of crops and animals was developed at Murebet and brought back to Tel Abu Huraira. Murebet weakened and Abu Huraira thrived sometime after 7000 BCE. The growth of Tel Abu Huraira after 7000 BCE is absolutely considerable. Originally hunting wild gazelle to the brink of extinction, the Natufia culture made way for the pre-pottery Neolithic culture and developed goat and sheep farming. With the coinciding crop domestication, the site became fully agricultural and very much can be described as Neolithic. The village kept thriving and increasing in size, maybe even as many as 5,000 people were living there. Before the abandonment, the houses were built from timber, but after the reoccupation, they were made from mud bricks. The mud bricks would have been constructed using mud, sand and water, and were either sun-dried or fired in a prehistoric kiln which wouldn't have been unlike a prehistoric oven. This would have coincided with the emergence 
of pottery at the site, which would have been essential for transporting yields of crops, as well as sand and water around this huge village. Eventually, as we know, all good things must come to an end. It appears that the site was completely abandoned around 5000 BCE. However, the population may well have gradually declined in a lead up to this, so it may not have been a dramatic end, but it is difficult to tell this definitively. Fast forward to the 20th century and the politics of the sovereign state of Syria, made independent from France after the Second World War, the Syrian Republic was overthrown by a coup d'etat in 1963 and plans to build a water dam on the Euphrates River started to become a reality. The dam would ultimately flood the lands of Syria, many of which were of archaeological significance, including Tel Abu Huraira. Archaeologists rushed to the site to gather as much information as possible before the Tabka Dam was completed in 1973. The site of Tel Abu Huraira now lies underwater at Lake Assad. Thank you.